Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. It's DK Bhattacharya speaking to you and we'll be talking about uh, Paleolithic cultural succession of East Africa. Before we talk about East Africa, we must also talk about the importance of the region. This is also known as the Rift Valley because there are two tectonic plates which has been constantly shifting to the north and therefore have created huge rift. And that is why the name Old Y Gorge comes in the, in the understanding of lower Paleolithic culture of East Africa. That's the predominant feature of the geomorphology of the region. Because of the rift, because of the tectonic motions, there has been a huge number of lakes created in the region. Lake Rudolph, Lake Victoria, Lake Kamasa, you name it and you have it. Some of the lakes have maintained as much as 1000 feet high uh, watermark in one of the pluviations. So there were four pluviations and each of the pluviations created huge inundation of the region and a large deposit of lacustrine deposits. So you have uh, lacustrine deposits referring to each of the pluviations and then of course there is a dry phase for which there is no deposition and then again a second pluviation comes. On the basis of these lacustrine deposits we have been able to identify four phases, climatic zones or four climatic phases for East African prehistory. These are called Ageran, it's counted as the first Pluvial, then you have Kamasian, and then you have Kanjiran, and last one is called Gamblian. Some people believe that Kanjiran is also not a separate pluviation, it's a part of the Kamasian pluvial. So, Kamasian pluvial seems to occur in two waves, like the interstadial and stadials in European glaciations. So, you have the four pluviation, and classically speaking, they are taken to identify lower Pleistocene forming Kageran and middle Pleistocene forming Kamasian and Kanjiran, and Gamblian is taken as the upper Pleistocene. But, however, <coughs> We have now um, magnetic polarity reversal dates also which superimpose with the pluvial dates and the earliest of the deposits that we have found in the Old Y Gorge refers to 1.8 and 2.2 million years and that obviously is lower place to say belonging to Kageran. All right, this is the cultural succession or geological succession, but we must also know about the human evolution that is represented in these old Y gorge depositions. We have found Homo uh, erectus, which is from Cheswanja, dated to 1.8 million years. We have found Homo habilis, which is dated to 2.2 million years. Recently, there was in Lake Turkana, uh, again in Old Y Gorge, a place called Lake Turkana, you have found a Homo habilis occurring almost up at uh, 1.4 or 1.5 million years. Earlier, we used to think that Homo erectus has been evolved from an ancestral form called Homo habilis. But the fact that Homo habilis continues even after Homo erectus has been evolved led many people to believe that there are two parallel branches of some ancestral form which has yet to be discovered. Fortunately, there has been a skeleton discovered recently by an Australian paleontologist and this is named as Australopithecus sediba. Australopithecus sediba is date antedates or 2.2 and therefore it can be taken as the ancestor of both Homo habilis and Homo erectus. Another point. More and more scientists are today coming with the opinion that Homo erectus did not evolve in Africa at all. It must have evolved somewhere in Asia. Most probable region they say is between the Caucasian mountains or the, or the Caspian Sea and the, and the Jordan Valley. And this, we have a site in Jordan Valley called Ubedia, which has a date of 1.4 million years, uh, which is actually in hand axis. So you have a possibility of Homo erectus having evolved somewhere in Asia, and we still do not know whether it is Africa or Asia. If we accept that Homo erectus evolved in Africa, then we have to accept that after evolving in Africa, it migrated to China and it migrated to Asia. And if you accept that Homo erectus evolved in Asia, then we have to accept that from Asia, it went to both Africa and Europe and also China. So either way, we have to have more data to prove it and that is a moot question to discuss. But we have to talk this in the background of the fact that we are studying lower Paleolithic culture of Africa in order to understand the lower Paleolithic culture which happens to be the first culture that man ever, ever created the early, early man or early member of our genus, then we need to know the fossil kinds as well. And it has been always done. In African prehistory, we cannot avoid the fossils and the tools because they are always found or mostly found associated with each other. 
the, it's the tools that come from the deposits of the river Kafua and reference to Kageran pluvial. Uh, Kageran is not really represented in the old way rift valley. Kageran is along the river called Kafua and the tools that were found were called Kafuan tools. Kafuan tools of course all the basis of stratigraphy, some alluvial stratigraphic position has been identified as forming three different stages Kafuan 1, Kafuan 2 and Kafuan 3. And Kafuan 3 is almost parallel to Old Y Gorge which happens to be happening in the Rift Valley and not in the river. So we have a development which is sort of sort of precursor to the old one but is is have going parallel to old one at the point of its emergence. So these are two different areas. One is the alluvial deposition, the other is the lacustrine deposition of the Rift Valley. So the so Kafu and 1, Kafu 2 and Kafu 3, let us take them all together, are early lower Pleistocene deposits and they represent a couple of choppers, very very primitive but mostly big big flakes and these choppers and big flakes therefore has to be taken as the workmanship of Homo habilis and not Erectus. So this is the kind of precursor or ancestral deposit that we are talking about in East African prehistory. We entered the rift valley, no we left the river and we come to the rift valley. When you come to the Rift Valley, there is a huge succession of lacustrine deposits, each one or most of them having very beautiful dates and also some large amount of fossils along with it. So the fossils, the tools and the dates, all three make a kind of a successional chart for entire European, uh, African, East African prehistory, which looks like chapters in a book. They're so, so well arranged that people take it as a classical succession. We always take East African succession as a classical succession of uh, Lower Paleolithic culture of uh, East Africa. And we give the name Old One to about 11 layers. The, the, the starts from Kamasian goes up to Kanjiran. These 11 layers, very interesting, all the layers show progressive development of one stage into the other. The, for instance, if old one 1, which is dated to almost 2.2 million years, will have chopper chopping continue. Old one 2 or old one uh, layer 2 will have a kind of chopper chopping with a pointed end. All chopper chopping by definition has a transverse working model. By progressive uh, flaking of the borders, you come to a stage where you have a chopper or a chopping tool with a pointed end. So that is old one stage 2 and old one stage 3 you find that the pointed border remains and even the surface of the core is a little bit flaked. So this is the way a chopper chopping slowly entirely morphological changes demonstrated in each of the stratigraphic layers and it emerges as a hand axe. So it can I think it's the only site in the world where dated with, de uh, with attested with dates, you can show a morphological change from a chopper chopping into a hand axe as an internal stage of development. And if you include Kafuan along with that, then it is even pre chopper chopping that you have from lower Pleistocene date, slowly progressing to give rise to a chopper chopping and then to a hand axe and cleaver. The tools are usually made in either quartz or quartzite. There are sometimes dolomite is also used. So they are suitable lock material of the same region. It goes on and on until you come to a final stage of Kanjiran and this final stage of Kanjiran is called Forest Smith culture. It's called Forest Smith not because it is not an old one but because we want to have a parallel term with Acheulean of Europe. And we, this is the entire thing which is pre-forest myth, that means occurring into Kamasian and part of Kanjiran is taken as Chilean of uh, East Africa. So Chilean and Acheulean, these two stages mark the entire Middle Pleistocene of East Africa. This forest myth culture shows the development of some musteroid flakes. There are circle uh, uh, discoid cores, there are level of flakes, there are some flake tools and some fl very good flake points. So right in Kanjiran, which marks the middle Pleistocene or end of middle Pleistocene, you start getting flake tools. Of course, the moment you enter the next stage, there is a remarkable change. You enter the next stage which is called Proto-Steel Bay and Proto-Steel Bay occurs in Gamblian, the last pluviation. 
if you look to a parallel it will be the last glaciation in europe where you have the cold mousterian continuing if you remember in the southwest france so you have cold mousterian in the beginning of uh, worm here you have mousterian which is protostilbe and it's not mousterian we call it protostilbe which has hand axis continuing beautiful hand axis in cleaver but discoid core is included and large number of flake tools so you can talk in terms of a mousteroid industry developing out of later schulian in the last pluvian of east africa after that something peculiar happens after that is not really after that it is parallel to the period after that somewhere else in other sites a kind of development takes place which is called capsian now capsian is the last of pleistocene deposit last of pleistocene deposit and you know what are the tools microliths trapezes lunates microblades and along with that and along with that you have some ill fired pottery you have uh, ostrich egg shell used as broken egg shells used as necklaces so capsian seems to be a development which is totally different from any upper pleistocene development anywhere in the world so you see protostilbe is mousteroid but capsian is not not upper paleolithic anyway it looks like more of holocene culture so here is a scenario which is very important to remember here is a scenario in east africa where right from within the mousteroid base of upper paleolithic i don't call it mousteroid base i am saying it is upper paleolithic anyway mousteroid base of upper paleolithic a mesolithic character starts developing a kind of character develop which subsequently in holocene period can be named as mesolithic here you can't name them as mesolithic in spite of the fact that there are some ill fired pottery pieces we come to the final stage the final stage of course is called still bay because we have talked about proto steel bay earlier and we will talk about steel bay now this steel bay marks the end of pleistocene we would expect large number of uh, 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 blade tools burins and 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 solitary leaf points and what not but if you look at steel bay it still has hand axis continuing it still has level of flakes level of points continuing so here is a scenario in east east eastern africa where you do not get a proper upper paleolithic developing from within the lower paleolithic base point there are blades there are bigger blades there are some blade tools but the main theme continues to be flake tools so if you look at the succession from the beginning of let us say kafua and then after kafua you have the whole range of old wa old wa gorge 11 layers old one one old one two old one three old one four a very meticulous detailed and protracted developmental scenario of lower paleolithic then what happens the lower paleolithic continues to dominate the scene though <coughs> middle paleolithic gets incorporated and a middle paleolithic gets incorporated and there you have i mean you can't classically call it upper paleolithic middle paleolithic gets incorporated there are one or two blades here and there but it still doesn't make it a upper paleolithic tree and this is the last pluvial uh, pluvial deposition it marks the end of pleistocene so even if you have blade in the holocene you can't call it upper paleolithic so you know when you talk about east african prehistory you come to terms with certain features which we have experienced when you dealt with it dealt with india it is foolish to look for a parallel of europe everywhere the europe especially southwest europe the franco cantabrian region the kind of four traditions the kind of art objects the kind of bone tools it is foolish to look for the similar development elsewhere or everywhere we have a rich development of art in uh, in africa we have in south africa art which can be antedating possibly lasco but then that far and no further the bone tools can't survive in this climate so you don't have bone tools in fact even the stone tools don't show show these in gravation points and 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 shuttle peronian knife and and end scrapers and burins so you have a total change over in upper pleistocene of east africa and it is certainly not comparable and should not also be called upper paleolithic at all and nobody calls it it is always referred to as old one succession 
good enough, then we accept old on succession as the kind where a lower Paleolithic and a protracted period of time develops into a middle Paleolithic dominated culture and that far and no further. But how do you explain Kapsin? Kapsin cannot be explained in, in the terms of this indigenous development of a middle Paleolithic from lower Paleolithic. Kapsin has trapezes, has microliths, has ill-fired pottery, has uh, ostrich eggshell, uh, eggshell necklaces. So it suddenly is a very different development from within and in middle Pleistocene, upper Pleistocene of East Africa. So East Africa therefore cannot be put as a single area. It has differences. It has differences which are more coastal, more in hinterland, a part which is less hinterland. So you have all kinds of developments demonstrable everywhere. One point, there is a technique which is very easily demonstrable all over South Africa as also East Africa, which is they make a hand axe and then in, especially in Lake, uh, Lake Victoria, uh, it's make a hand axe, then uh, remove a flake in an elongated manner. So that in the cross section, this hand axe will be V like this cross section. This part will be narrow and would be like a knife, and this part will be the usual thick part. And this is uh, what has been called as Victoria West technique. Professor Francois Bourde has a theory that Lavalois technique did not become or come overnight. He said the lower Paleolithic people knew how to finish a core and then take a flake out, and I would like to call Victoria West technique as para-level work technique. He said, I will call it para-level work, which show the antecedent behavior in the lower Paleolithic period, which eventually in the later period becomes level of flaking technique. So this is one development which is quite different from Europe and quite different from many parts of Asia, but certainly not much different from India, except for the fact, of course, in India, we do not have such a protracted occurrence of lower Paleolithic tools. So East Africa is classical for the protracted level-wise lower Paleolithic development. So you have a huge layers of 11 layers showing uh, slow and steady development of a chopper chopping culture entering into hand axes and cleaver. One point about the cleavers. Africa has a huge number of cleavers which are made on side flakes. Now these cleavers are not there in Toralba Ambrona. These cleavers are not there in Africa, uh, Europe. You have African cleavers which are very similar to Indian cleavers. Many of the techniques of making East African tools are also identified by Vedi Krishna Swami in, Dittara, in uh, Atirampakkam. I don't know how to explain this. It seems to be a parallel development, but there are similarities of techniques and also types between East Africa and India. But then India also in itself shows variations. You know, the Western belt and the Eastern belt, they have their internal variations. But this kind of variation is there also in Africa. So we are trying to propose that if you try to study East African prehistory, you must study it in a regional pattern. There will be regional developments which needs to be understood. And that way, possibly Capsian can be described. Otherwise, in a sequential manner, Capsian looks outside the scenario. I mean, there is a middle Paleolithic, and inside Capsian comes with microliths. So obviously, it doesn't fit in the sequence. But then, if you go for regions, it might it might satisfy the development of a regional imperative. There can be regional imperative of many places, but then it is a, it's a, it's a transected. It's a, it's a fissured area. So many uh, lakes surrounded, and you cannot really transgress the lake. Some of the lakes are like sea and very big lakes. So you have truncated area where cultural diffusion or contact can be almost nil and when there is no contact cultural contact then regional developments become more insular development and these insular developments possibly explain why capsian developed in this region here i would like to digress a little we have talked about the generalized successional pattern of east african prehistory and uh, we still feel that there are some regional developments which needs to be considered. In this light, though in the same rift valley, I would like to consider a site called Hartobori in east of Ethiopia. Now in east Ethiopia, this site Hartobori has been very well excavated. There are layers in one layer which is dated to 160,000 years. Three skeletons have been found. The skeletons are late erectus 
or early sapien skeletons large number of hand axes are found with it now if you follow the molecular biology theory of mitochondrial dna having come out of africa then hartebeuri seems to be the ancestral form of anatomically modern homo sapien amhs if he is the ancestral form of amhs then he is still having hand axes and nothing else along with some flake tools having having shown the development of 160000 years which is a little before the last cluviation then you come to old way gorge and see the protostilvian capsian we are dealing with protostilvian capsian where upper paleolithic has not developed at all why should it develop because in hartebori the same date you are finding hand axes continued and we found the same in protostilbe in protostilbe you find hand axes cleavers along with that discoid core and some of beautiful flakes even the flakes are not very beautiful level of flakes they are the usual flakes so you have a scenario where from the entire rift valley from ethiopia down to rhodesia the entire rift valley hand axes and cleavers continue in a variegated form for a long period of time in fact possibly 3/4 of the pleistocene duration and stages after stages well documented by stratigraphy and this protracted development goes parallel with the evolution of homo erectus so you have a huge period of lower paleolithic development and then suddenly we don't have a neanderthal then we don't have an upper uh, homo sapiens sapien but we start getting later schulian or uh, late erectus or early sapiens and capsian is a classic example of late erectus early sapien uh, tool types and so is still there so keeping hartibori in our mind we are pro proposing that east africa maintained large duration of lower paleolithic successions and there is no specific line you can draw to differentiate middle from the lower paleolithic least of upper paleolithic you cannot really say upper paleolithic begins here still bay is taken as upper paleolithic by some because it is a closing phase of please to see Of of the Gamblian pluvial. After Steel Bay, you have the Mesolithic cultures. So some consider it as Upper Paleolithic, but otherwise, a classic Upper Paleolithic type that we have identified in Franco-Cantabrian region is present in East Africa. It is rightly looks like similar to many sites in India. In India, also we don't have a classical Upper Paleolithic everywhere, as we have talked earlier. We have Upper Paleolithic in some sites, like in Belan Valley and so on. In Africa, also you don't have Upper Paleolithic of the type of of Southwest Europe or Franco-Cantabrian Europe. So, shall we say that when you look at the cradle of human civilization, that is East Africa or Old Way Gorge, you do not find a kind of fourfold division of upper paleolithic so well attested by franco cantabrian archaeologists as reflected in africa you do not have have a um, ad origination perigordian solutrean magdalenian azilian we don't have those fourfold divisions occurring in africa at all and no wonder we don't think uh, find them in india as well so here is a scenario which is quite individual and it is very important because it shows the cradle of human civilization in terms of the skeletal finds huge amount of skeletal finds of morphological changes from homo habilis to early erectus to late erectus to early sapien to anatomically modern homo sapiens sapien so the anatomical fossils hard evidence of evolution is going parallel to the development of lower paleolithic sites but it does not reflect the upper paleolithic of the european kind at all before we conclude we must consider the situation of capsian this seems to be so unimpressive in the sense that it doesn't fit in the sequence of old way god succession it seems to be completely exogenous to the region and we don't have anything which shows its ancestral form what did it evolve from where did it come is it exogenous or is it evolved from protostilbe it certainly is not evolved from protostilbe protostilbe is a mustoroid culture along with lot of andexes continuing and this is similar to what we have seen in thames valley which is called high lodge and baker soul there are two sites where andexes continue with the flake tools so protostilbe cannot be the ancestor for capsian 
Many scholars have found individual sites where they have identified a protocapsian, that means the ancestral form of capsian. And if the ancestral form of capsian could be taken as something which is similar to Upper Paleolithic of France, Upper Paleolithic of Franco-Cantabrian region, then you can say from Upper Paleolithic, the, Meso the Mesolithic type of trapezes and points have arrived. So you have a capsian which is evolved from an ancestral form called protocapsian. Now these attempts have been taken because otherwise you cannot prove where from it came and how it develops suddenly into microliths and that too with, with within Pleistocene period. Now we have microliths in Pleistocene period in many parts of Southeast Asia but here the sudden appearance of microliths requires an anthropological explanation. So Capsian remains a kind of exogenous uh, regional development for which there must have been a kind of an ancestral form and this ancestral form in some sites in East Africa has been given the designation of calling proto -capsian. A proto -capsian, therefore will be taken as the early Gamblian or last phase of uh, of pluviation, a beginning of the last phase of pluviation, and there a changeover takes place, taken entirely to flake and blade, unlike protostilve. Protostilve is not dominant with flake and blade, but dominant with discoid core and hand axis. So here is a differential line, possibly a branch that took off from protostilve to give down to proto. Capsian. So protocapsian can be taken as a bilateral development, a lateral ramification of a new regional type which may have eventually given rise to capsian. We still don't know if capsian is ancestral to stilbe, certainly not. proto stilbe can be taken as ancestral to stilbe, but capsian needs to be taken as ancestral to the early Holocene cultures. Uh, which is which is something nothing to do with Pleistocene period. So this is a very interesting development of bilateral ramification within the last pluviation. So last pluviation you see many developments, and that is true because last pluviation becomes much milder in climatic uh, imperatives and people start expanding, they are more sure of themselves unlike the first two pluvials which were massive. So it, instead of being so massive they have become milder and people intrude upon various areas and thereby they create what is known as regional cultures. So um, Capsian and Proto-Capsian can be taken as a regional development when proto Bay was taking place in the mainstay rift valley proto capsian developed in the drier phases or drier regions and that developed into capsian and one of the capsian forms is also put in the successional chart of east african prehistory so obviously you are coming across regional development which has to be accepted from right within pleistocene period microlithization takes place we have many evidences of this kind in southeast asia but africa this is the first evidence of a of a microlithization evolving from within Pleistocene and is not taken to be a development of only Holocene period. It is also important to remember that there is no climatic change of or a vast climatic change from Pleistocene pluviation and early Holocene climate. Even early Holocene period there are two wet phases Makalan and Nakuran. These are not pluviation because this is in Holocene period. So you have wet phase continuing even in the Holocene period and there you have varieties of uh, Mesolithic developments because their microliths are legitimately Mesolithic in this period and Capsian is the ancestral of all these Mesolithic developments. Thank you.